Hi everyone. Sorry the video took so long this time. I had a hard time fighting off my urge to procrastinate. There was just something kind of intimidating about the length of the script this time around. Strap in for the longest video in this series yet. Also, watch to the end for a short Q&A where I'll be responding to some of the questions or requests I've gotten. That out of the way. Welcome back to my series on the lore of the Korean MMORPG Mabinogi, where today we'll finally be looking at Generation 8, Dragon. Settle in, grab a drink, and try not to think of Skyrim as we finish out Chapter 2, The Pioneers of Eria. Generation 8 begins with a short cutscene explaining the origin of the Dragon Apocalypse mentioned in Generation 7, telling us about something called the Conduction Ceremony and the Gold Dragon. A noble named Chassere was chosen as the Conductor once, and the evil in his heart caused the calamities we learned about in the last generation. All of this, as we know, came to an end when Irinid appeared. The scene changes and we see Krumkura on the ruins with the tiny pyramids we offered the artifacts to in Generation 7. He explains to no one in particular, I suppose, that he has brought the new Conductor to Iria in preparation for the Conduction Ceremony. That's right, if you haven't guessed, we're dealing with more Rory, my favorite person. The cutscene ends now, and the Malaysian arrives in Vales. Called by the village chieftain, the Malaysian ventures into the frozen waste of northern Iria to meet with him. The chief, named Krug, wishes to speak with the Malaysian about the Irai ruins, and hopes they will side with the giants in their claim of ownership over the area. Their claim lies in the fact that the Malaysian had discovered the memories of the ancient giants there, and they anticipate the elves will stake similar claims. In order to enforce his ownership over the area, the chief intends to send out an expedition, and requests that you enlist Tanez as its leader. However, Tanez denies this request, voicing his belief that the war Krug would start is pointless, and stating that he is nearly blind to boot. The Malaysian returns to the chief with his answer, then wanders south to meet with Effie. Effie has called the Milesian in hopes they will help her find her younger brother, stating she'd heard word of someone matching his description around Lake Zardine. The Milesian dutifully accepts her request and heads back north, eventually encountering a man by the name of Kelpie. Kelpie doesn't recall Effie, mentioning he has lost much of his memory. The Milesian takes a rough sketch of the man and returns to Effie who confirms that Kelpie is indeed her estranged younger brother. She asks the Malaysian if they'd be willing to find the Mirror of Memory to help Kelpie recover his past. And so they depart once again, this time retracing their steps to Atrada, who they had given the Mirror to previously. Atrada tells the Malaysian that she has recovered most of her memory, most importantly her memories of Tanez, but also many painful ones. She requests them to deliver a letter to Tanez and says she will get the mirror for the Malaysian in the meantime. We, the players, are given a brief glimpse at what she has remembered, and we see the same conversation she'd had with Tanez in Generation 7, but also an older memory. We see a young Atrada being discriminated against by her fellow elves for being a cursed child. Through this memory, we learn that elves with black hair are born only as the omens of impending disaster. The cutscene fades, and we resume our journey. The Malaysian once again makes the long trip to Vales, finding Tanez under house arrest for rejecting Krug's orders. He is delighted when he receives Atrada's letter, and tells the Malaysian he longs to escape to Atrada's side, but can never do so on his own. He implores them to go and tame the mirror which is Unicorn, and gives the Malaysian a special powder needed to enter the dungeon the Unicorn lives in, along with the tools they will require to tame it. The Malaysian plunges to the depths of the Par Ruins, fighting through various monsters until they encounter the Unicorn. It is a stubborn beast, but with great difficulty the Malaysian is able to tame it, and takes it just outside the Vales, where it can be ready to help Tanez in his escape. With this done, they venture back to Philia to speak with Atrada. She returns the mirror, not quite apologizing that it had broken after she used it, and stating they may have to go get it repaired once again. Seemingly unfazed by this, the Malaysian travels to Kor to see Voigt, an appraiser who had repaired the mirror for them before. Voigt takes a look but says he isn't able to fix it this time as it's beyond his skills and sends you to a friend of his, Aranen, in Kalida. The Malaysian makes their way there and Aranen confirms that they could fix the mirror but demands Sulphur Ores' payment. 
Upon receiving his stinky rocks, he follows through on his word and repairs the mirror. The Milesian gives the mirror to Kelpie, who stares deeply into it. We see a glimpse of his memories now. We learn that he left for Iria before his sister, traveling across the Moyer Ocean, and that he had rescued a lost elf named Phasilus. We also see that Phasilus had fallen ill, ultimately turning into a desert ghost in front of Kelpie and the Queen of the Elves, Castanea. Castanea had revealed to Kelpie that the same fate awaits every elf due to a curse cast on them by Irinid, and that she had erased their memories of this fact using the Memory Tower to keep them from living in despair. She uses her magic to wipe Kelpie's memories too, apologizing for the pain it puts him in, but rationalizing that she must do it to keep him safe. This knowledge at hand, the Milesian departs to Philia to speak with Castanea, in hopes that she can fully restore Kelpie's memory. Castanea is as cool and distant as ever, telling the Milesian that she cannot restore the memory she erased, and still stands by the convictions that caused her to cast the spell in the first place. However, she does offer a nugget of guidance, telling the Milesian that the memory tower was designed in the image of the relic Irin had left behind, and that the answers may be found in Zardine. The Milesian once again backtracks to Kalita and speaks with a woman named Belita. Belita is a gold mine of information about the gold dragon, and mentions that the red and blue dragons have been acting up as the conduction ceremony grows near. She asks for the Milesian's help in studying how their activities are impacting the area, sending them out to collect flint rocks and tame some animals so she can study their behavior. With the Milesian's aid, she confirms that the conduction ceremony is indeed having an impact on the ecosystem around Zardine, and begins working to find the exact location where the ceremony will take place. As a final request, she has the Milesian take a hot air balloon to clear out the flocks of wyverns in the area, and set out on a surveying expedition to observe the activity of the volcanoes around Zardine. While they are busy observing the volcano, the balloon is beset by another horde of wyverns. Before the Milesian is entirely overwhelmed, a red dragon appears and defeats the pest before introducing themselves as none other than Krumina, the leader of the red dragons. She tells the Milesian that she is thankful they are safe, and that there are evil dragons plotting something as the conduction ceremony draws near. She asks that, should they find her in trouble, the Milesian return the favor and help her in her time of need, and then departs, leaving them to return to Belita. Belita says that Krumena had helped her in the past as well, but that the Milesian should find a way to protect themselves without her help, and mentions something called the Irinid Bolt. She explains that Irinid's magic was once used to slay dragons, and that some of that magic still lingers in the fossilized remains of those creatures. The Milesian recovers some fossils, and, with Belita's help, draws the magic from them, creating a ballista bolt imbued with it. Once the bolt is completed, she informs the Milesian that Krumena is in trouble, and the Milesian sets out on a special balloon to come to her aid. They find her in combat with another dragon, and, in keeping their promise, the Milesian fires the Irinid Bolt at her attacker. The aggressor falls into the lava below, and Krumena finally drops her ruse, overjoyed that the Milesian had helped her kill none other than Krum Krua. The Milesian realizes they've been had, and heads back to Kalita to seek out the advice of Legatus, the Blue Dragon. Legatus explains the geopolitical situation of the Dragon World, that after the war with Irinid, two major factions arose. The Blue Dragons, the dominant faction who accepted the punishment given after their defeat in the war against Tyranid, and the Red Dragons, revolutionary types who were upset by the new status quo. Legatus further explains that the Red Dragons have been plotting to use the Gold Dragon for political gains, and that they are likely gunning for Krum Krua because he's the leader of the Blue Dragons, and, like, the president of Zardine. Legatus continues his lore dump saying that despite Crumb's death, he can still sense the human he had been carrying. He sends the Milesian to collect a snow crystal so they can withstand the heat of the volcano and recover Rory. The Milesian conquers the Par Ruins dungeon, recovering the crystal before entering the volcano where Crumb fell. There, they find Rory, who repeats the mantra from Generation 7. The shackles on the burning land have been broken, and lifeless soil is seeping through. I know, and I see, the fate of this dark land. The Milesian tells Rory he is needed for the conduction ceremony, to which Rory declines, 
He explains that the Milesian is the one actually meant to be the Gold Dragon's conductor, and that he was only ever meant to guide them to Eria. But, but the Milesian was there anyway. At no point did Rory motivate us to be there. They, they literally included the worst character in the game for no reason. The Milesian returns to Belita, who is surprised that Rory survived for a moment before realizing that he has plot armor, verbally, in front of the Milesian. So, I guess at least someone noticed. The Milesian goes and speaks with Legatus, once again. Legatus tells them that the Reds probably have a conductor candidate of their own in mind, and asks if the Milesian is willing to fill that role for the Blue Dragons, to prevent the Reds from bringing about a new dragon apocalypse. The Milesian agrees, and the goddess allows them to climb onto his back, and the two take flight. The pair arrive at Rene's, a small island off the northern coast of Iria, and enter the hatching cave where the ceremony is due to take place. Krumena is already there, along with the Red Dragon's conductor candidate, Atrada. The Milesian is confused, questioning why Atrada would choose this for herself. Krumena answers for her, explaining that she has chosen to sacrifice herself to bring an end to the curse Irinid had placed on the elves. Krumena taunts the Milesian, and then attacks. The Milesian beats Krumena like the red-headed stepchild she is, until a short cutscene. Empowered by the hand of the writer, Krumena one-shots the Milesian. Though, luckily, Tanez appears at just this moment, writing the unicorn you got for him. Krumena is surprised, but easily handles the blind giant until Atrada interferes to save her beloved. She uses the Wind Bell from Generation 7 to guide Tanez, who is able to slay Krumena. The Miletian hears the voice of Adniel, the Gold Dragon, acknowledging them as the new conductor. Adniel says the small light inside the Miletian shall become the eternal flame of Rhaenys once more, but warns that the dark fate of Iria may still come to pass, and that the return of Irinid is soon at hand. With that, Generation 8 comes to an end, and the Malaysian earns the title, The Dragon Knight. With the Generation story taken care of, let's slide into the mythology. And I guess given that the Generation features and is named for dragons, they'd be the ideal place to start. Dragons are extremely, extremely common figures in mythology. From ancient Greece to Korea and everywhere between, Dragons thrive in folklore. Since Mabinogi draws mostly from Celtic influences, we'll focus there for now. In Welsh mythology, red dragons are actually good creatures, representative of Wales and the Welsh people, and are often at war with white dragons, representative of the English, a theme that we might see repeated. What little I could find about dragons in Irish myth painted them as fairly generic but fearsome monsters. Golden dragons, like Adniel, don't really bear any significance in European myth, but in Chinese folklore, golden dragons are associated with strength and divinity, so I guess that's a possible influence. That said, we once again have to look at the most ancient of sources. First introduced in the mythical past of 1974, in the depths of the Dungeons and Dragons first edition box set, the Gold Dragon is the original Metallic Dragon. Metallic Dragons in D&D are the Goodaline Dragons, while their evil counterparts are the Chromatic Dragons. The Chromatic Dragons included the colors white, black, green, blue, and red originally, but basically any color you can think of has its own special dragon today. Like Adniel, D&D gold dragons are considered to be some of the most powerful or most important, and they even elect a king of sorts among themselves. That's where the similarities end though, really. Honestly, now that we're at the end, I feel like most of the relevant things were covered last time, and I'm a little bit at a loss of what to talk about. I guess we could talk briefly about unicorns. Unicorns are weird, as in like what you think of a unicorn 
is probably not as accurate as you think it is. In modern fantasy, unicorns are usually just pretty horny horses, but mythological takes on the unicorn range from resembling cows more than horses, to just being a rhinoceros, to things that kind of look like a horse but actually resemble goats. Narratively, too, unicorns are a little bit weird. Like those creepy dudes that everyone knows at least one of, mythical unicorns are a little bit obsessive about whether girls are virgins. Often, unicorns could only be captured by virgins or were wild unless presented with a virgin. I even found some freaky things about them liking to be breastfed by virgins, so take from that what you will. Uh, also, unicorns were often used as a Christ allegory, so yeah, it's, it's weird. The most relevant symbolism of unicorns to what we see in Mabinogi probably comes from Scottish heraldry. Unicorns were believed to be a natural enemy to the lion, and lions were a prime symbol of English royalty, and thus symbolized strength and prestige for the Scots. And that is basically all I have this time. I'm sorry for the somewhat more lackluster analysis than usual. This generation just doesn't have that much to go on. Uh, instead, I want to answer just a couple questions I've gotten and uh, talk about some of the content that's coming up on the channel. Uh, so, Sodasama asks, are you planning to do all generations? Uh, yeah, I do want to do all generations. It might take me a little while. I do want to go back to, like, well, not necessarily all the time, but I do want to try, like, doing a Generation 1 video style opening gag where I like edit together an anime opening because that was a lot of fun. Uh, it just doesn't really fit in with my current release schedule. I know this video came out pretty late but I've been trying to do, or I was trying to do every Thursday slash every Friday. Uh, but yeah, no, I just, I don't, I haven't had the time. But I do want to get back into it. Especially if I can, like, hire an editor to kind of take some of the load off of me so I have more time just to fuck around with the creative side of things. Uh, but yeah, I do want to eventually do all generations and, like, any other major story content. So, like, the talent quests and all that good stuff. Especially the chain slash one, because I feel like that one's actually narratively important. On the April Fool's video, Sanjo Brahma says, I think you should do more lore videos for more games, maybe other Nexon titles. Uh, I definitely want to look into other games. I don't know about Nexon titles in specific because I just haven't played any other than Mabinogi. Uh, I, I mean, I played Maple Story once, like a long time ago, on a private server. But other than that, I just haven't really played them. Uh, I know that Vindictus is like a, a pseudo-prequel to Mabinogi, and maybe I'll check that out and make it like a like a mini-series of my first impressions, and then eventually start like a lore series on it if I like it enough. But yeah, uh, definitely do want to do other games. I have other scripts in the work right now for titles that aren't Mabinogi, and uh, I hope you guys will actually watch those. Uh, I have another question here from Sanjo. He asks if uh, the book I mentioned is actually called Torlock's Book. Uh, no, the book is not called Torlock's Book. It's called Torlock's Record in the game. You can get it during the Generation 3 quest line. And uh, I don't know if you can get it back if you destroy it. Torlock might have uh, like a keyword for it. But I don't actually know. If he doesn't, you can always just find it on the wiki. It is uh, under the Generation 3 spoilers on his page. Finally, uh, Nation, although I think she's changed her name since she asked this, on the Discord asks if I would do a video that goes in depth for the towns in the game and like dive into the lore behind Dune Barden and the NPCs there and any other information that I could get from like. Uh, quest or NPC dialogue, and yeah, I do want to do this. I already told you I do, but this is basically like a soft announcement that I am actively working on it, so keep an eye out for it. Uh, in the way too much time between the last video and this one, we've hit almost 100 subscribers, so I just want to say thank you again, especially to everyone who has subscribed. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet and you like my content, please consider hitting that button. 
It really helps me out and helps grow the channel. And if you are subscribed, but you just want to get a little more involved with me and my community, uh, my socials are linked down below in the description, as well as a Discord server for the channel. That is just a way to hang out with us when I'm not, you know, actively putting out videos. And I do try to message everybody that joins the server, and I try to talk back when I'm talked to. I can't promise that I'll always get back to you, but I will do my absolute best, so don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, I also wanted to say that I'm not quite sure what the next video is going to be. It might be the Dune Bard and Lore video that I mentioned in the question section, or I do have a pair of other scripts that I'm actively working on. One is a very short script, basically about the origin of the Witcher setting, and how all the monsters and just the setting in general came to be. And the other one is a very, very long video about the Project Moon game, A Library of Ruina, which has ruined my life. And I feel the need to explain how and why. So, I don't know which one's going to come out first, but no matter what, I hope you guys will check it out and that you like it. And, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So thank you guys for watching, as always, and I'll see you next time. Bye!